So how's your memory? <laughs> Loaded question, right? Story about a, a wife. She walked into the kitchen one day and her, her husband was standing there and he was in complete shock. He had this, this shocked look on his face. And she said, honey, what is wrong? What's, what's going on with you? And he said, well, I just got back from the grocery store. And, and I realized when I walked in, they, they checked my temperature with one of those things they do on your forehead. And, and sweetie, it erased my memory. Because you told me to get milk and bread, and I came back with two boxes of fresh donuts. Something, something's wrong. That's not a story that actually happened to me. Um, that's, that's me in the story. You know, whether it's uh, getting old, or whether it's COVID brain, or whether it's stress or anxiety, or, or whether it's you just really did prefer donuts instead of milk and bread, we all have moments when our memory fails us, moments when we, we can't remember something. But then on the flip side, we have moments where our memory doesn't fail us. We have moments where there are these moments, these experiences, these family traditions, whatever they may be, we remember them and we long for them. And what if there was a way for there to be a type of memory that never faded away, no matter what? A type of memory that we live in and, and relive and experience, and it never goes away, no matter what's happening in our lives. We continue our series, Rope of Hope, where we are journeying through Psalm 42, and we're looking for that rope of hope that we can grab a hold of no matter what happens. And today our message is longing for hope. And hopefully what we will find is this way of remembering that this best thing that we remember never, ever goes away. Listen to Psalm 42, verse 4. I remember these things and pour out my soul within me. The psalmist is having a moment where he's remembering something and what he's remembering is causing his soul to pour out. And what that means is it's stirring up sadness in him. What he's remembering is, is stirring up some sadness. We could say that he's remembering the good old days. And that's a good thing. The remembering the good old days is very good for our hearts and our minds and our souls. It's a, a very positive thing. And at the same token, if we're Christians, we always have to remember that the good old days technically haven't happened yet. We, we remember the former days with joy or with sadness. We remember those moments and those times, but we also remember that whether they were good or bad, whether they were happy or sad, the good old days has never been and will never be the destiny of any Christian. Why? Jesus had a friend named Lazarus, and Lazarus died. And four days later, Jesus showed up, and he stood outside the tomb of Lazarus, and he said, Lazarus, come out. And John chapter 11 says that Lazarus did come out. He got up and he walked out of the grave. Lazarus wasn't mostly dead. He was dead, dead. And Jesus raised him from the dead. We don't know exactly, but, but pretty good guess that about two weeks later, there were some men in, in dazzling clothes. And they were sitting outside of the tomb of Jesus and they made an announcement, he is not here, he is risen just as he said. Jesus was not mostly dead, Jesus was dead, dead. And by the power of God the Father, Jesus, God the Son, raised himself from the dead. This is exactly what Jesus said he was going to do even before Lazarus died. The story of Lazarus is John chapter 11. In John chapter 10, Jesus said this. This is what he said about his life. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it back. So what's the difference between the 
resurrection of Lazarus and the resurrection of Jesus. I heard somebody put it this way just a few days ago. The resurrection of Lazarus was to what was. The resurrection of Jesus was to what will be. That makes the resurrection of Jesus completely different. See, the good old days are great, but they are not best. They are not best because we have been saved not to what was, but we've been saved to what will be. The best is yet to come. But the psalmist wasn't having that kind of day. (laughs) He he wasn't vibing on that. In fact, in, in this moment, he's remembering something that's making him sad. What does he remember? Next part of verse 4. For I used to go over with the multitude and walk them to the house of God. For some reason, the psalmist hadn't been to church in a while. We don't know why. Maybe he was sick. Maybe he was just lazy. Maybe he bought a place at the beach or the mountains or, or the lake or or. You know, maybe he got a new car or a motorcycle or something. He, he just got busy. Maybe, maybe there was a pandemic and, no, and nobody could go. Maybe, maybe he had just grown old and wasn't physically able to make it anymore. Maybe he was under church discipline, was just unrepentant, causing problems. And so they'd asked him to stay away for a little while. Or maybe he was so depressed, so full of despair, that he, he just couldn't make it to church he just couldn't do it we don't really know why there's some guesses historically but but ultimately we find him in this moment remembering he's remembering pouring out his soul in a sad remembrance that he used to worship God with God's people he's remembering that he used to worship with the people of God and specifically he remembers he used to walk them to the house of God. He's the leader of the band. Have you ever led a large group of people? I've been leading large groups of people since I was in the 11th grade. And, and I'll tell you, it's not always the easiest thing in the world to do. But I remember one particular moment of leading a large group of people. And, and this particular moment, technically this is the 29th anniversary of this particular moment because it happened at the Clemson Florida State football game down in Tallahassee, Florida. I had the, the opportunity to be on the cheerleading squad when I was in college, and my responsibility on this particular day was to take the large orange tiger paw flag and lead the team out onto the field. So the mascot, mascots, if you will, of Florida State is Chief Osceola and his real live horse, Renegade. And what happens at the beginning of the game is Chief Osceola goes out in the middle of the field and he throws a flaming spear down in the middle of the field. So he rides his horse out, flaming spear. So I'm standing over at my tunnel. The team's behind me. I got my flag ready. I'm waiting for the signal that I can start running out when suddenly a Florida State trooper who in my memory was 6'6", 250, leaned into my face and quietly said, Son, you go anywhere near that horse with that flag and you'll be in jail before kickoff. Needless to say, I hugged the sideline that day and got nowhere near the middle of the field. But I remember those days. They, they were good old days. Those, those days when I got to lead the team out. It, it, it was fun. The psalmist, he's he's remembering these good old days. These these good old days when he used to lead the church to worship. He used to lead the church to enjoy the greatness of God. But for whatever reason, those days are gone. But he's longing for them. He's longing for those days. He's not, not necessarily longing for the pageantry of the church parade. No, he's longing for something deeper. Look what he says in verse 4. With a voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude celebrating a festival. He's longing for joy. He's he's longing for thanksgiving. Not not the holiday with all the pumpkin spice green beans and pumpkin spice cranberry sauce and pumpkin spice turkey and whatever else we can pumpkin spice. 
No, it's not, not the holiday. He's longing for this attitude of thanksgiving, this attitude of joy. He was full of despair. He was down. He was discouraged. Remember, this, this psalm has been described as, the discour- as, as an honest prayer from a discouraged saint. He's discouraged. He's, he's praying. He's crying out to God. He's down, he's discouraged, and he wants some joy. Ever been there? Ever had a moment where you were so down and so discouraged, and you're like, gosh, I just, I wish one thing would go right today. I wish I could just get maybe two things to come together that would go my way today. I wish I, wish I could have a, a little bit of joy, just a, a little bit of thanksgiving. Don't miss the non-accidental math that we have here in this passage. Joy and thanksgiving are not accidentally put together. You see, a joyful heart will create an attitude of thanksgiving. And a grateful heart will create an attitude of joy. These these two things are, are designed to go together. So if you are discouraged, if you are looking for joy, then immediately look for something to be thankful about. Look around you and find a way to be thankful. Be thankful for for something in your life, some experience, some person. Be thankful for the good and the bad, the happy and the sad, because all of those things have brought you to the moment and the point that you're in right now. But someone may say, you, you don't understand, my life has been awful. And there's there's really nothing to be thankful for. Well, if that is your story, I am so sorry that your life has been that hard. You know, as Christians, we have this borderline evil notion that if someone has a hard life, it's their fault. You know, they didn't apply themselves in school or or they're lazy or, or whatever it may be. But the reality is we've forgotten that but by the grace of God, our life could be awful. And it could have nothing to do with our work ethic and nothing to do with which side of the tracks we grew up on. But if you are a person that says, I have nothing to be thankful for. Life is awful, it's terrible, I can't think of anything to be thankful for. Then then by default, we would say that means you've never met Jesus. So we would invite you to turn to Jesus even now. Because for the Christian. No matter how bad things get, there is always something to be thankful for. Always. And, and if you're a, a professing Christian, and, and right now you're as grumpy as the day is long, you're mad, you're angry, you're sad, you're afraid, whatever it is, whatever that emotion is, then, then I want to repeat what I just said. If you have been saved, if you've been redeemed, if you've been rescued by Jesus, no matter how awful things are or feel, no matter how stressed out or or afraid or frightened you are about money or politics or the government or your health or backordered parts, whatever it may be, there is always something to be thankful for always and what is that Paul was writing the church at Rome he put it very simply like this Romans 8 verse 1 there is now no condemnation at all for those who are in Christ Jesus dear Christian we can always be thankful because we are no longer condemned in our sin Our sin, not in part, but the whole, has been completely and fully nailed to the cross and we bear it no more. And that means that no power of hell and no scheme of man and no election and no rise in gas prices and no word from the doctor can ever pluck us from the hand of God. It's not possible. So in that, we always have something to be thankful for. 
And if you cannot be thankful for what it means to be rescued by Jesus Christ, what it means to be redeemed, what it means to no longer be condemned in your sin, then at the very least, it would be in your best eternal interest to determine, have you truly turned to Christ or did you just join a church by statement or by letter? Is there life from Jesus in your heart? Is the Holy Spirit working in your heart and mind and soul. You see, the psalmist, he's not turning to a Clemson football game or a Carolina football game or a great country music concert. He's not turning to the beach or the mountains or the lake. He's not turning to all the different things that sometimes we are tempted to turn to. He is turning to one thing. He's turning to worshiping God. That's where he's turning. His heart and his mind and his soul is remembering what it means to worship God and worship God with God's people. And why? Why is that what he's remembering? Why isn't he remembering something else? Well, here's why. Because he knows that worshiping God is the only thing that will last forever. Worshiping God is what we have been saved toward what will be. Now, what was but what was, what is, and what will always be. Worshiping God is the only thing that will last forever. That's why the old saying rings very, very true. Only one life, which will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, which will soon be passed for all of us in one way or the other. Only what is done for Christ will last. Why? Because what's done for Christ moves us to worship. What's done for Christ is about what will be. The psalmist is remembering what it was like to almost forget that anybody else was in the room. He's remembering what it like what it was like to, to be with God's people, worshiping God. And he wasn't thinking about who was sitting around him. He wasn't thinking about what he was going to have for lunch. He wasn't thinking about what he loved about the church or what he hated about the church. He, he wasn't thinking about anything but this unbelievable reality that he was getting to worship the goodness and the greatness of God through the reading and the teaching and the preaching and the singing and the praying of God's word. He was finding joy. He was finding thanksgiving. This church exists to help you find God and help you enjoy God. And, and all the people that are involved with every moment of this church, our, our minds are geared toward helping you find God and help you enjoy God. However, the worship of God is not our responsibility, it's your responsibility. It, it's not my responsibility to worship God for you. Ultimately, your worship is your responsibility. Now, I want to do everything I can not to distract you from worship, but your worship is your responsibility to God. The choir sang earlier about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the helper when it comes to worshiping God. He, he is the helper of all helpers. The rest of us will do our best, but he's the helper. I heard someone say recently that there's probably two main reasons that most people who attend church don't understand or talk about the Holy Spirit. And they kind of broke it down into these two main categories. One is that there is so much confusion that has infiltrated the world in the last hundred years or so with the extreme, uh, extreme, extreme wings of of hyper-charismatic spirituality. But the other reason they gave is because if we begin to look at the person of the Holy Trinity, the third person of the Trinity, if we begin to really look at the Holy Spirit, we will realize, oh man, I got to give control to the Spirit. And you know what? We're Americans. We're Southerners. We're Westerners. We're humans. We don't like giving anybody control over anything. So we're going gonna, gonna to sing about the Holy Spirit for like one song, but we ain't really going to do anything with the Holy Spirit, right? Well, this is one sermon, and I can't fully pontificate on the third person of the Trinity in one sermon, but I I do want to say just a a few things to help us think 
about the beauty and the power and the authority and the help of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to do it by what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. John 15, verse 8, Jesus said this, He, the Holy Spirit, will testify about me. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to not give you tinglys in church. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is is not to give you some fantastic dream or vision in the middle of the night. The primary purpose of the Holy Spirit is to bring attention, draw attention, bless our hearts, force our attention toward Jesus Christ. J.I. Packer said that, that the work of the Holy Spirit is like a floodlight ministry. We know floodlights, right? You you don't look at the floodlight. You look at what the floodlight is shining on, right? I mean, at Christmas, nobody walks around looking at the floodlights in people's front yards. They they look at how the floodlights light up all those gorgeous wreaths and all those decorations. The floodlights help us to see something. This is what Packer said. It is as if the Spirit stands behind us, throwing light over our shoulder on Jesus who stands facing us. That's that's the primary work of the Holy Spirit, throwing light over our shoulders so we can see Jesus. Then he goes on. The Spirit's message is never, look at me, listen to me, come to me, get to know me. But always look at him, see his glory, listen to him and hear his word. Go to him and have life. Get to know him and taste his gift of joy and peace. That's what the psalmist is looking for, right? Joy. I remember when I used to have joy. I remember when I used to have thanksgiving. The Holy Spirit is designed to help us find our greatest, deepest joy and thanksgiving in Jesus Christ. But guess what? There are a lot of people, places, and things that will try to distract us from those floodlights. There's a lot of people, places, and things that will try to distract us from truly worshiping Jesus Christ. I've been in the church 50 years now, and and I can say over the last 50 years, some of the strangest, um, most interesting, and meanest comments I've ever heard, I've heard at a church building. There are people, places, and things that will try to distract you from worship. They'll try to ruin your worship. And you know, sometimes they'll succeed a little bit despair, discouragement. It it will try to ruin your worship. And you know what? Sometimes it'll succeed a little bit. But we need to fight the good fight that the psalmist is fighting. To fight this, this good fight of saying, wait a minute, I really want to worship so that I can have joy, so that I can have thanksgiving. I want to worship in such a way that I remember I am no longer condemned. That I've been rescued and I've been redeemed. The psalmist is remembering what it means to worship God. Why? Because worshiping God is what will be. Worshiping God is is what we've been saved to. Worshiping God is the one thing that will last forever. It cannot be erased. The best is truly yet to come. But today it may not feel like that to you, right? Right? Today may be a day you're, just, you're not feeling that best is yet to come stuff. You're not, you're not feeling what you've been saved to. So what do you do? What do you do when you feel like you're having a really hard time worshiping? So I'm going to skip over Halloween and Thanksgiving and run to Christmas for just a moment. But for most of you, that's no big deal because you've been listening to Burl Ives and Thurl Ravenscroft since Labor Day, all right? So you're, you're already in. I got you. Just curious. You don't have to raise your hand, but I sure want you to. Anybody got your Christmas tree up yet? Oh, my goodness, the Wileys. Are you kidding me? That is both impressive and scary. Uh, that, that's good. I love that. Look at y'all. Man. Just one. Oh, just one. Wait a minute. That means there'll be more than one eventually? Bless, bless, bless. I love that. I knew there'd be one. I didn't know it'd be y'all. Good job, Stuart. You're a good husband. I say that because I'm a terrible husband because I don't know when the tree's going to get up. Um, 
So, so imagine this scene, okay? You have a three-year-old little girl who asks about Christmas every day, pretty much all year long. You know, is it Christmas yet? Is it Christmas yet? Is it Christmas yet? Is it Christmas yet? Well, Kristen is a wife and mom who lives in Minnesota, and that's what her three-year-old was like. A few years ago, she was writing about how every day their daughter just kept saying, is it Christmas yet? Is it Christmas yet? Is it Christmas yet? And so early in December, either late November or first week of December, they put up the Christmas tree. And boy, she was ecstatic. So the next morning after the Christmas tree was put up, you know where this is going. She comes busting early in the morning into that room with the Christmas tree, so excited. Surely it's time for Christmas. And there were no presents under the tree. So she went and found her mom, and she said, I've waited, and I've waited, and I've waited for Christmas, and Christmas is not coming. Ever felt that way? Ever, ever felt like that back-ordered part for the refrigerator is just not ever going to come? Ever felt like that extra credit work that the teacher promised is just never going to come ever felt like that promotion at work is just is just never going to come or that test result from the doctor is just never going to come ever felt like that change in your spouse or or your teenager or your 20 something is just it's just never going to come ever felt like that darkness in your soul that you can't shake that that change for that that light for that darkness is just never going to come my guess is we've all had at least one moment like that where, where the darkness just would not lift. So what do we do then? What, what do we do in that moment? Well, in that moment, we worship while we wait. We, we worship while we wait. Kristen said, you know, what my daughter needed that morning was not a tree full of presents. That wasn't her greatest need. Her greatest need that morning was to trust her parents, to trust what her parents have done, to trust the character of her parents, to trust what her parents had promised, to trust that putting up that tree was not a lie. But Christmas was really coming. And Kristen goes on to say that's what we should do. We should learn to trust God. That's our greatest need, to trust God. God, to trust his character, not, not blind faith. There is no blind faith in Christianity. There's no blind faith. We're not fools. This isn't a fairy tale. We have great confidence in the character of God, great confidence in the work of Jesus Christ. So we trust God's character. We trust what he has done, and we trust what he has promised. We worship, and we trust, and we wait. And you know one of the greatest things and one of the greatest ways that we can worship while we wait? This, together. One of the greatest ways that we can worship while we wait is to do it together, to be a part of God's church, not Easter and Christmas, not even just on Sunday morning, but a part of of the family of God, engaged with the family of God, worshiping with the family of God. Kristen goes on to say this, when in our worship we catch a bigger vision of the strong and kind heart of our God, did you see the progression today? We began the service with, behold our God. Bigger than Buckingham Palace, bigger than the White House, bigger than the world. Behold our God. That's how we began today. That's what we sang to begin. Kristen says, when we worship together, we catch a bigger vision of the strong and kind heart of our God. Then we are well prepared for the waiting that lies before us as long as we live on this earth. Don't miss that. You and I, every single one of us, will wait, okay? I know we think that the younger generation is impatient. We're all impatient. We all live with instant gratification, no matter how old we are. 
So we're going to wait. That's, that's part of life. But we learn with the greatness of God actually how to wait. She goes on. We wait together for the one we long for most, our God who brings salvation. And why do we wait like that? Because this is a hope that will not disappoint. You will disappoint me, and I will disappoint you. It'll happen many times. But God cannot and will not ever disappoint. It's, it's not part of his character. He can't not fulfill his promises. Christian says this, when the waiting is over, we will worship the one who fulfills our expectations beyond what we could imagine. Listen, we're going to be a lot like that three-year-old girl with a lot of situations. We're going to say, is it, is it time yet? Is it time yet? I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Why hasn't this happened? Why hasn't this happened? Why hasn't this happened? Can I just encourage you that the cross of Jesus Christ is a deeper and greater tree than a Christmas tree. And the promise of the cross means beyond a shadow of a doubt that we have every reason to worship Jesus while we wait. And while we're worshiping, remember that we have been saved for what will be. So the best, the absolute best, has not already happened. Unless Jesus comes back today, it won't happen today. But the best in Christ is yet to come. It truly is.